Yeah, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. It's now time for Today in History, and today we're taking it back to the 10th of March 2010. On this day in history, um, about 5,000 Nigerians, including you know, activists, gathered in Abuja, the Federal Capital Territory, to demand that President Umaru Musa Yaradua makes a public appearance and address Nigerians. At the time, Yaradua was 58 years old and he had just returned to Nigeria from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, where he was receiving treatment for a heart condition. It was also said that he, also, he had other health conditions, including uh, problems with his kidney. He passed on two months later on May 5th, 2010. And uh, even before that, on the Nigeria's constitution, Jonathan became you know, president. He went on to contest and won the elections of April 2011. Yaradua has been praised for having a clean government, you know, with, you know, transparency, electoral yeah. reforms, amnesty to the Niger Delta militants. He assumed office in 2007, ruled for just about three years, became the first president to publicly declare his assets, won the love, you know, and admiration of lots of Nigerians. And uh, political analysts say he would have done more for Nigerians if not for his ailing health. He was a one-time governor of Katsina State, and uh, he's revered as being the best Ni Nigerian governor uh, president so far since our return to multi party democracy in 1999. But this day in history, that protest held several people wore t-shirts, you know, saying save Nigeria group, enough is enough. They wanted to see their president in person. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I was like, what was I mean, that? <laughs> it's two things. So for the first one All is, right. the first one is, I remember um, that there was, you know, something that was really, really uh, popular that happened then where former President Dulcigo Basinger placed a call to um, Yaradua. Um, and yeah, I think he had asked, uh, Omar, are you alive? Omar, are you? I don't remember <laughs> what the words were, but that was a very, very, you know, funny moment in Nigeria's political history um, where that had to be done. Um, of course, to assuage you know the fear, fears of Nigerians. That's one. The second one is now you you know you just mentioned that people wore T-shirts, people wore you know um, you know came out in the streets Huge to ask you know that then. the president shows himself. You know, I'm and I'm really asking where is all of that today in Nigeria? Um, because you know the, these were moments in our history where Nigerians felt like they had the power to demand certain things. Um, we don't see a lot of that happening anymore. We don't see a lot of, you know, those same people coming out to make those demands or make similar demands. Uh, we, we've gotten to a place where we now, you know, low-key accept, you know, that, you know, the, you know like um, I think it was uh, Femi Adishina who mentioned it, that, you know, it's, it's a shy president um, <laughs> and, you know, this is his style of government. You know, he doesn't need to speak with the Nigerian people every now and then. He speaks with the Nigerian people through his, you know, press, you know, representatives and, and the likes. So um, it's interesting, you know, that, you know, we've moved from that era to where we are today. Uh, oh, Sarge, um, I do have an answer to you for that. Yeah. First of all, the people who organized this protest who were, you know, at the forefront of this, they were the people, they were the ones who, you know, actively pushed for the not too young to run bill. They were the ones who pushed for the, uh, the sex for grades, uh, you know, the agitation or the... Uh, all the clamor you saw online, they pushed for that. They were also the, the, the group responsible for, you know, when, you know, at that time when police officers were alleged to have been, you know, going into public places, you know, basically arresting women, raping them. They were the ones who also pushed for that Abuja raid. I can't remember what the I hashtag remember. was. I remember. Yeah, but um, what I'm saying is those, they're still very active. And even more so, we saw the answers protests, how Nigerians came, came mm -hmm. out in mass. But even though most of the protests we're seeing now is moving massively online, we still see these things, but the issue has been the government or the police security officers clamping down on people who, who come out to protest. Oh, so you know? same thing. We're those same people because I'm sure that there was still the, that government or do, do you know those government, um, um, ac that government architecture was still available then during Yaradua's time. It was available during Obasanjo's time. It was available during Good Luck Jonathan's time. Um, but, you know, th th there doesn't seem to be a lot of that anymore. And yes, I agree that, yes, there's a lot of uh, online protesting that goes on these days, but... Online uh, advocacy. I think what um, changed really is not the voices of the people. Maybe they got quieter. What changed was, you know, the the force that security agencies, you know, began to use to, you know, 
come down heavily on people. I think over time we've seen that become worse and worse. And you don't expect to see anybody willing to, you know, come out and carry placards anymore, you know, to protest because you've seen what people have done to others. You've seen how they've been humiliated, bitten, well, harassed. So would you like to protest? Well, the point if, of... If they I, call I, for I, any I other protest? I don't... I, so so that's, that's what happens. I'm, I'm here to do, you know, the job of that's a journalist. That's what happens. <laughs> the, the, the times are different, and that's the point I'm trying yes, to make. And I remember also different. a passenger's phone call. All right. Also today in history, we're looking back at 1969. And th this one comes with a little bit of conspiracy theories, with some controversy. Reverend uh, uh, Jesse Jackson, you know, was one of those who, you know, got, you know, mixed into this co um, conspiracy theories. He had claimed, uh, and I'm speaking about Jesse Jackson now, that the FBI, you know, was involved in Martin Luther King's death. Um, there was also the part where uh, James L. Ray, who we're speaking about this morning, uh, claimed that he was set up, you know, and he wasn't necessarily the one who pulled the trigger um, uh, um, of the shot that killed Martin Luther King. But it was on this day that James L. Ray confessed or pled guilty, rather, uh, to killing Martin Luther King. He was, you know, eventually convicted also in 1969 and sentenced to 99 years in prison. Um, he, of course, initially and in 1968, underwent rhinoplasty, which is facial recognition surgery. And then on the 18th of March, also 1968, drove to Atlanta, Georgia. It's a really confusing, um, not confusing, but, you know, it played out, you know, in, in a couple of months before he eventually um, he shot Martin Luther King, drove to Atlanta, Georgia, and from there to Alabama, where he bought the gun, and then uh, found out, you know, through the news that Martin Luther King was going to be in uh, Tennessee. And so he then took his gun and moved to Tennessee. On the 4th of April, 1968, he uh, killed Martin Luther King with a single shot fired from the Remington rifle that he had bought in Alabama while uh, Martin Luther King was standing on the balcony of his hotel room uh, with uh, Jesse Jackson and some other um, reverend. He then drove after, you know, firing the shot 11 hours to Atlanta and then picked up his bags, fled to Canada uh, with a fake name and a fake passport where he hid for about a month and then acquired another Canadian passport and fled to England with a new name, Raymond George Snide. Um, it was, of course, at that time that there was already a nationwide manhunt for James L. Ray. Um, his face was all over the place, and he was eventually captured um, on June 8, 1968, at the Heathrow Airport when he was attempting to leave the UK to Brussels with, once again, a fake passport. He was extradited to Tennessee on his birthday, 10th of March, mm. um, 1969, and uh, that was his 41st birthday and eventually confessed and was convicted to, you know, 99 years in prison. He died eventually in 1998 after spending 29 years in prison. Um, and, of course, in that time, of course, there were many conspiracy theories, the ones about the FBI. Uh, the King family, of course, uh, believes that the U.S. government, the mafia, the Memphis police were all involved in his killing mm -hmm. and that uh, James L. Ray was just a scapegoat uh, that was used to co uh, commit that crime. Um, James L. Ray also spoke about a man called Raul, Raul. <laughs> who, Raul. He, who, <laughs> who he said, um, you know, you know, roped him into the whole mess. And, you know, he claimed he wasn't really the one who pulled the trigger. He hmm. you know, kind of knew about it, but he wasn't responsible. But of course, uh, from forensic, you know, investigation, fingerprints on the gun and mm -hmm. on the bag that he dropped after running away from the hotel showed, you know, he had his fingerprints. Even if I've seen a lot of movies where fingerprints can always be put on, you know, certain items to frame people True. up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately for James L. Ray, there wasn't enough evidence um, or anyone on his side to prove that uh, he wasn't guilty. Yes. That, that's, my God. I remember this issue because when you talk about Martin Luther King, he evokes lots of you know, memories, especially for the American people, how he basically helped his massive campaign and movement towards you know, emancipation of the blacks and his famous I Have a Dream speech. And regarding his murder, it's still shrouded in controversy because like you mentioned, his family believes that James L. Ray was set up. They believe that you know, the government had a hand in this. Alone. Sorry? That he didn't work alone. James Elroy yes, didn't yes. work alone. That he, they even, believe, even his son, Martin Luther King's son, says the family believes that he was innocent. Not even talking about working alone, because in other quarters they say if James L. Ray had committed petty crimes before he was caught, he tried to escape prison about two or three times he yes. was caught, how would you be able to successfully commit murder? and you facilitated an international travel, change your passport alone, he definitely would have not been able to do that. I mean, all, all evidence points to the fact that he definitely had help. About 
if he was innocent or not, I can't really say because I watched interviews of him. He first confessed that he had you know, committed the murder. But after that, he tried to recant and say, no, he didn't do that. He was set up. He's innocent. Even when he was dying, he insisted that he was, his, I think he said his last words were that he was innocent. So we, 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 we really would never know what happened. But these are just the facts that we know about uh, the murder same of way, Martin Luther King. Same way we may never know um, um, who killed JFK. Yeah. Um, anyway. We're, of course, uh, taking a short break. When we come back, we are moving to the speaking. Royal um, family. Royal family. Yes, uh, um, Queen Elizabeth has responded to the drama, of course, from the Harry and Meghan inter um, interview with Oprah Winfrey. And we'll be talking about all of the little, little details here and there when we come back.